progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we prepare to open the word this morning, <clears throat> and as we prepare to study deeper into these examples that we are given, shall we seek the Lord's guidance so that our, our minds may be open, so that we may look to the path that is before us, so that we may keep the light that has been given for our feet in its proper place. We need the Lord's guidance so that our feet do not fall off of this path. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, there is much to be seen. There's much yet to be learned. As you are showing us these examples, as we are placing these examples in relation to our time, we are amazed as to the items that we yet need. We cannot be self-sufficient. We know and we are seeing more and more clearly day by day just how much we need you. Direct us today. Help us to understand that which you would have us to know. May your will be done. May we come ever closer into relationship with you so that more and more we are prepared to accept your character and not the character that we have formed. Help us today direct our paths, direct our thoughts. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, at the close of yesterday's session, there were comments that were being made regarding the ox goad. And the comment that I made is that this might be something for us to consider. So if you would like, sister, go ahead and present your thoughts. Okay, I went to, uh, well, <clears throat> when I first heard about the ox code that got this passage of scripture, just part of it, right, about <clears throat> the oxes being sacrificed, and then the prophet went off to serve the Lord, I thought, well, which prophet? It's, it's e Elisha, and I thought, where is it, in, where is it in the Bible? I finally found it yesterday, First Kings. 19, or maybe it was the day before, 19, 19 to 21. Uh, I think it is. So, and then I also, uh, Prophets and Kings, uh, 217 on. Okay, so I'll read part of Prophets and Kings. Elisha's father was a wealthy farmer, a man whose household was among the number that in a time of almost universal apostasy had not bowed the knee to Baal. Theirs was a home where God was honored and where allegiance to the faith of ancient Israel was the rule of daily life. In such surroundings, the early years of Elisha were past. And, you know, it describes how he came from a godly family and was used to following the Lord, you know, used to that kind of kind of discipline and had lived in in uh, in in nature it was a useful worker habits of simplicity. And. <clears throat> Uh, he had taken up the work that lay nearest. He possessed both the capabilities of a leader among men and the meekness of one who is ready to serve. So as I was reading this, I was thinking these are the qualities that we need to have. 
of a quiet and gentle spirit. He was nevertheless energetic and steadfast. Integrity, fidelity, and the love and fear of God were his. And in the humble round of daily toil, he gained strength of purpose and nobleness of character, constantly increasing in grace and knowledge. While cooperating with his father in the home life duties, he was learning to cooperate with God. By faithfulness in little things, Elisha was prepared for weightier trusts. I think that's in Luke 16, 10, about he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Day by day, through practical experience, he gained a fitness for a broader, higher work. He learned to serve, and in learning this, he learned also how to instruct and lead. Uh, skipping down a bit, faithfulness in little things is the evidence of fitness for clearer, greater responsibilities. Every act of life is a revelation of character, and he only who in small, <clears throat> excuse me, duties proves himself a workman that needeth not to be ashamed can be honored by God with higher service. And then on page 219, it says, a man may be in the active service of God while engaged in the ordinary everyday duties, while felling trees, clearing the ground, or following the plow, William Miller comes to mind, the mother, and then says, the mother who trains her children for Christ, I wish I had properly, is as truly working for God as, in the as is the minister in the pulpit. Uh, success depends not so much on talent as on energy and willingness. <clears throat> Conscientious performance of daily duties, contented spirit, the unaffected sincere interest in the welfare of others, in the humblest lot, true excellence may be found. The commonest tasks wrought with loving faithfulness are beautiful in God's sight. Now, <clears throat> when, when Elijah called him and he said, um, he left the, uh, says he left the ox and ran after Elijah and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And Elijah's answer was, go back again, for what have I done to thee? Uh, this was not a repulse, but a test of faith. Elisha must count the cost, decide for himself to accept or reject the call. If his desires clung to his home and its advantages, he was at liberty to remain there. But Elisha understood the meaning of the call. He knew it was from God and he did not hesitate to obey. Not for any worldly advantage would he forego the opportunity of becoming God's messenger or sacrifice the privilege of association with the servant. He took a, a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments, which must have included a goad, one would think, of the oxen and gave unto the people. So he's feeding the people. And you can see the symbolism in that. And they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Without hesitation, he left a home where he was beloved to attend the prophet in his uncertain life. Had Elisha asked Elijah what was expected of him, what would be his work? He would have been answered, God knows. He will make it known to you. If you wait upon the Lord, he will answer your every question. You may come with me if you have evidence that God has called you. Know for yourself that God stands back of me and that is, it is his voice you hear. If you can count everything but dross, that you may win the favor of God, come. And then in Patriarchs and Prophets, I only found a tiny, tiny mention of Shamgar. Okay. Now uh, <clears throat> okay yeah now the point yesterday was to address ox goad and we do seem to be coming a little far afield how does this relate to what we've been studying the last few days that's what i would want to know aside from the characteristics that we are supposed to be having I just find it funny that that would go into my mind and then I would go on the search because I am just, as Colin was saying, trying to fit the pieces of the puzzle. You know, I'm trying to get them all to fit and, and comprehend what's happening here. 
Well, what I could say is that when we're looking at the um, with Shamgar, so we're looking at, at the message. It's a judge. And uh, this message relates then to uh, the symbols that are being used here. So we, we look at the ox goat and we see that this is a representation of line upon line. And, and this is about a measurement that's being done. We, we sort of agreed with that, that this is instead of a sword or a spear, we're going to, or instead of a sword, we're going to have this ox goad. And, and we looked at the different Hebrew words here, um, uh, like 600, 6 being an overplus. Um, uh, that is, you have the hand, with, which has five fingers, and a 6 is one over that. And then we have the word 100, which means a multi, as a multi, multi, multiplicative, multiplicative, and a fraction. So we can see that these are measurements. And then the ox code, the idea that it's being used, um, the word ox itself having to do with, with the, the plowing, and then the goat itself which is related to this other word, which means to teach. So now when we look at, um, and where was that where you were reading, which is the main scripture that you were reading from? Like the main, because what's, what's the biblical reference to that? Uh, that's... Uh, no. <clears throat> First Kings 19. Okay, First Kings 19, okay. Right. Um, First Kings 19 to Elijah. Yeah, Elijah and, and Elisha. Elisha. 19, 19 to 20. The call of Elisha, there it is. Um, right, so he's plowing with these 12 yoke of oxen. And, and, and there you were just, you were looking at the fact that you have these instruments, uh, instruments of the oxen. Right, and then that they're going to be fed. Um, mm -hmm. So, so can we? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where where uh, the connection is here, um, other than we have oxen that are boiled um, with the instruments. So the that would be the the yoke. Now we know that the yoke um, represents a chiasm as well. Right, so we've understood that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I don't know if how we could fit this in with what we're doing specifically, other than just in a general sense. I don't think there's something specific, other than that we can we can take this Elisha message, and and relate it to our message. But I mean, there's a connection there, but I don't think it's a direct one. All right. That, that's just my opinion there. Yeah, I mean, there's a connection there. I mean, the ox, the oxen, but because we get some of the same symbols, but they're they're not really talking about the same period of time or anything. It doesn't give us any more information than we already have regarding what the ox goat is that this is about instruction now we can see he's going to feed the people uh, a message yeah so that i mean that but that doesn't connect it directly to shamgar as as a time period no i realized that but i thought there's got to be something in here i i took a lot of it for for what the Lord's been trying to show me, you know, too. And I thought, well, maybe this is just for me. But then I thought, maybe if he's dealing with me and me in a certain area, maybe it would benefit somebody else. Yeah. So, well, the one, so the one thing I would say is that, so right now we are in the time of the Elisha message when it comes to this movement. And so there's the commitment 
to to God the call and also the responsibility to feed the people with a message but that's that's broader than looking at Shamgar himself as representing where where that is in the message but but they are tied together I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, I tried to find some info on Shamgar, but and I thought, well, I don't have my Ellen White app. So then I started searching, what did Ellen White say about Shamgar? And all I found was that passage in Patriarchs and Prophets, which yeah. tells me part of anything, just because he was one, one of the judges. Yeah, so the main and thing here, I, th I think, is the symbols that we see in in this verse that it does relate to uh, the message that we are using, the, the, uh, the, uh, the method of presenting a message, which is this line upon line, drawing out these lines and the chronology. So that to me would be the primary way to understand that related to Isaiah 28. All right. Now, yesterday, when we were addressing these portions from the book of Judges, mm -hmm. I was asked if I had the ability to bring up the portion from Signs of the Times on the screen. And at that time, I did not. Yeah. It, it's very interesting that the lessons that are being presented in this particular chapter of Judges are lightly addressed by Mrs. White. But we have this one article that was written in June 16th of 1881 on the defeat of Sisera. Now, a comment from the chat is 616 is equal to 88 weeks. June 16 and 1881 reminds me of 1188 or 11 weeks and 88 weeks. Now, how can we make application with that, with what we're looking at here? Okay. so. I didn't quite follow what you're doing. So you're saying that 616? Right. June 16th. Yeah. Okay. June 16th is um, 88 weeks. Okay. But we know that that, relate, that can relate to the 88 months, right, from the first day of the 10th month, or not 88 month, 88 um days right on the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month in 457 bc and and that relates then to uh the end of collins prediction january 11th uh 2023 to um the first day of the first month in this case would be uh, april 5th 2030 so that's going to be 88 months that's a day for a month. And then you're saying 1881? What were you doing right. with 1881? It looks as if, if, if the digits were being taken as instead of 1881, as 1188. Yeah, so the first day of the first month or 11 and 88. Because in the story of Ezra, you have 11 days uh, from the 20th day of the ninth month to the first day of the 10th month, and then 88 days from the first day of the 10th month. Okay. So, so that's what you're saying. Is it, it's, it's, and it's also here presented sort of as a, a chiasm. So you have the first day of the first month on either side with the 88 in the middle is another way of looking at it. So it's just... It's kind of an odd way of looking at the number, but but I see what you mean. mean. Um, so
Okay, and as was being presented by Stephen, 88 also connects to 457 because as 457 as the 88th prime number. Yeah, so 457 BC is the 88th prime number. Yeah. Okay, now this article, it does, it, it does take a small step back, but is related to everything that we were addressing yesterday. Because the first paragraph before us said, in, northern, in the northern part of the land of Canaan, near Lake Maram, lay the possession of Jabin, king of Hazor, and one of the most powerful and formidable of the enemies of Israel. In the days of Joshua, this monarch united with other kings against Israel, but was utterly defeated, and his city was burned. After some years, however, the Canaanites recovered from their defeat and rebuilt the city. A new king, Jabin, reigning like his predecessor in Hazor, rose into great power. The commander of his armies, Sisera, was an able and successful general. His forces were well equipped and powerful, including 900 chariots of iron. Now, we have two Jabins. Mm -hmm. One in the time of Joshua, one in the time of the judges. What do we know about Lake Maram? Uh, well, I know we ran into it before, and it's up in the north. Um, and what were a couple of items to consider? Lake Maram is one of three lakes. You deal with Lake Maram first in the northernmost portion, and then you come to what they would call, I believe, the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, so they're connected in some way, I believe. Uh, and then isn't the third one what they would call the Dead Sea? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, which is connected by the Jordan. Now, the interesting thing here is we would find this, the, the first connection with Jabin occurring in Joshua 11. Mm-hmm. Now, at that time, Joshua is given the word of the Lord. He is being shown that the children of Israel will utterly defeat Jabin. And as we have just read, they would burn the city of Hazor. Why is this example important for us to consider within the example during the time of the judges? Where is Jabin coming from? As we were just saying, the city of Hazor. Yeah. As he is coming from the city of Hazor, is he not coming from the north portion okay. of Israel? Yeah, it's from the north. So 
is this representation during the time of Joshua another example of a king of the north coming to battle against God's people? Mm. Yeah, um, but what's the significance? How are you applying the six significance here of a king of the north? Just with the papacy, the comparison? Correct. Radio. Okay. Now, when the papacy came to 1798, and the pope was taken captive by Berthier, is this not another symbol of the burning of a city? Because they were being removed from their throne. So, but, you're, so you're taking the first history here of the first Jabin, and you're comparing it to that history in 1798 Millerite history? Correct. And in Jabin as being our history? Correct. Okay. Can we make that application? Well, I definitely think you can take it as a repeat of history, especially since you have the same name. And it's one of the nations that was not conquered completely. I mean, because he's still there, even though they were utterly defeated and the city was burned. Well, you still have them survive. Right. And, and they rise to power again. So, so definitely you can, you can take it as a repeat of history. So Jabin would represent in this context, in, this, in how she's applying it here, if you're taking it as a repeat of history, would refer to the rise of the papacy again. Right. The Israelites, having again separated themselves from God by idolatry, were grievously opposed, oppressed by these enemies. The property and even the lives of the people were in constant danger. Hence, the villages and lonely dwellings were deserted, and the people congregated in the walled cities. The high roads were unoccupied, and the people went from place to place by unfrequented byways. At the place for drawing water, many were robbed and even murdered. And to add to their distress, the Israelites were unarmed. Among 40,000 men, not a sword or a spear could be found. Now, comparing this with Ezekiel 9, the men that come then with slaughtering weapons in their hands, we have taken that as a symbol, not as a literal weapon. With the application that the word of God is the slaughtering weapon. Are we, can we make the application here that the separation from church by or separation from God by idolatry is representative of what we are seeing around us right now with the church. And that it is our great need of study in order for us to be armed for the conflict that is soon to come. Now, so we definitely can apply this to, to our overall line, which is, is the application you're making here. That is, you're taking Millerite history and our history, which is a repeat of history. Right. And, and we can see then that we would, we would take it as the papal spirit that is being restored. Okay. Now, now remember that um, we had this 
August 29th date. And what was the August 29th date about? I'm not recalling quickly. Okay. Well, Stephen will know. So it had to do with the papacy. Yeah, that was when, yeah uh, that the Pope uh, Pius VI died that, on that date in 1799. And then Stephen and Stephen was kind of arraigned before Tess, Tess and Parmender and castigated, put it that way. Yeah, so they went before a papal tribunal on August 29th, 2019, 220 years later. This was the, the point that Jeff had made, is that it was a restoration of the pap papacy. So, so we can see that in our movement, we have a specific example of it, which is what we're focusing on here in Judges. So in Judges... We're taking that God has specifically shown us that judges can be applied um, to this movement from 2001 up until whenever, at least till 2023, if not further, and that we can look at each of these judges as responding to an enemy. And the enemy here, or the oppressor, would be this papal spirit that came into this movement um, and and oppressed it through Parminder. And, and this started, of course, before uh, 2019, because this really had started back when Parminder began, when he was chosen as, as the person to, to organize the movement. And, and he did this, he had already been working secretly with others, but he continued to work secretly. There was all kinds of, um, you know, and, and the thing that, you know, the best example of it was the camp meeting that they had in um, uh, Romania in 2017, which was an organizational camp meeting in September of 2017. And that what happened at that camp meeting was not to be discussed by those that were there, to anyone. So, so we had this whole, well, we can't talk about what happened at the camp meeting or what was discussed. And that, that of course, goes completely contrary to everything in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Everything has to be done openly. So, that was kind of a warning sign that went unheeded by, by most of us. Okay. So this is very important for us to pay attention with because it is a waymark showing us the position that the movement is currently within. Yeah. Now, the separation of the Israelites from God by idolatry is a message right now to the world. We cannot afford to have any other item as an idol before us because it will create a division between ourselves and our heavenly father in these situations in this example the sister white is showing that there was no place that was safe and 40,000 has a reference for us as well, because that is a, that, that's a major group that has not a sword or a spear. They have not 
the word of the God, the word of God. For 20 years, the Israelites groaned under the yoke of the oppressor. Then they turned from their idolatry and with humiliation and repentance cried unto the Lord for deliverance. They did not cry in vain. There was dwelling in Israel a woman illustrious for her piety, and through her the Lord chose to deliver his people. Her name was Deborah. She was known as a prophetess, and in the absence of the usual magistrates, the people had sought to her for counsel and justice. The usual magistrates. What does that say to us? What can we consider from those words? Well, well, the magistrates here uh, would be like the elders and uh, the priesthood. So, so the, there's been a break, breaking down of of the leadership. Have we not seen a breaking down of the leadership within? the movement itself yeah <clears throat> now I, I just want to address one point it's kind of an odd one sure um i was looking at uh, august 29th 2019 and and i was trying to match it with these 20 years now okay. if i go back um 20, 20 if i take a, a a year for a month in this case so i'm going to take 20 months and i go back from august 29th um uh 20 lunar months it brings me back to this date uh, january 15th 2018 now i don't particularly know what i would mark there uh, the only thing that's interesting is if i take uh 20 months and I do them as prophetic months of 30 days. So instead right. of months of 29.530587 days, and I count back, I count again forward from January 15th, I come to September 7th, 2019. So, really? the, so the, yeah, <laughs> and you see the significance there. Yeah. So I, yeah. So I don't know what January 15th is, um, other than it's just a span of time that connects these two different ways of measuring these 20 months. It ties these two dates together, August 29th and September 7th. So it just happens to be the difference uh, between the two. Um, but, but that's, of course, September 7th when Jeff uh, awakens from his sleep and presents the last sermon at Lambert Church. So so that 20 years, at least we can use it as this symbol to show the separation or the distance between August 29th and September 7th. And 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 this fits in perfectly with what we're saying as the application of this story when we apply it to this movement. That's very interesting. Yeah. The Lord communicated to Deborah his purpose to destroy the enemies of Israel and bade her send for a man named Barak of the tribe of Naphtali and make known to him the instructions which she had received. She accordingly sent for Barak and directed him to assemble 10,000 men of the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun and make war upon the armies of King Jabin. <clears throat> we have 40,000 without spear or sword. Barak is given the instruction to assemble 10,000. What application can we make here?
Why is it important that Barak assembles 10,000 men? Well, 10,000 we've already had as a symbol. And that was where? Um, Well, my mind would go back to the song that was being given of David that upset Saul so much. Yeah, we also, well, we also have uh, Leviticus 26, where it says, and 100 shall put 10,000 to flight. Okay. Um, and Deuteronomy 32, 30. Um, and we also had... Uh, in Judges 1, 4, and Judah went up and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand and they slew of them in Bezek 10,000 men. And also they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, Judges 3, 29. So, so we have 10,000 again. Um, so, so this is a number that shows up a few times. Yeah, and of course, referring to Saul is slain his thousands and David is ten thousands. Um, and then in Judges 20, we had the 10,000 chosen men out of all Israel that came against Gibeah. So it definitely is a symbol. I'm not sure of a symbol of what. Where it says Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousands. That's First Kings eighteen seven. It's pretty interesting. Okay. So symbol of July eighteen. Okay. So so it it means something as a symbol. So well, it's a, it. Sorry, Paul. Uh, no problem. <laughs> right. It's. Yeah, I'm thinking of uh, when 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 Daniel and the youth with him were were considered ten times wiser than the so-called sages. So you know, it's a multiple of a thousand. Ten thousand is a multiple of a thousand. Ten times a thousand. Mm -hmm. I mean, it shows up in lots of different ways throughout the Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 4, verse 15 is interesting. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet ye yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Right into the Corinthians. So that's interesting. 10,000 instructors. Can those 10,000 instructors refer to those that are within the church that are giving a, a message that is different from that which is given to the movement? Well, could. Uh, Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 14, 19, yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, then by my voice I might teach others also, then 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Okay. So, I mean, this the number 10,000 biblically is a symbol of something. Um, But also, you know, five, you know, he compares five to 10,000. Now, five, of course, could be the five wise. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, he could have used almost any number. He could have said six words or seven words, but he uses five. And, and this has to do with wisdom, right? Because five words with my understanding. But 
he rather speak that than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Okay. Barak knew the scattered, disheartened, and unarmed condition of the Hebrews and the strength and skill of their enemies. Although he had been designated by the Lord himself as the one chosen to deliver Israel and had received the assurance that God would go with him and subdue their enemies, yet he was timid and distrustful. He accepted the message from Deborah as the word of God, but he had little confidence in Israel and feared that they would not obey his call. He refused to engage in such a doubtful undertaking unless Deborah would accompany him <clears throat> and thus support his efforts by her influence and counsel. Deborah consented, but assured him that because of his lack of faith, the victory gained would not bring honor to him, for Sisera would be betrayed into the hands of a woman. Now, again, we are looking at this not as a person, but as a message. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that this message in their inner relation that we've been addressing was the message of the destruction upon Nashville. Mm -hmm. What we're calling July 18th. And that the call to give the message is that we're seeing that there was a, a general question a, a distrust of chronology in general mm -hmm. and that there was a, a question as to whether or not many would even listen or apply themselves to come to understand the message that was to be presented that would lead to the downfall of Jabin and his forces. Right, this, at this point, we have seen and we have understood that within, within the church, there are still many that are yet seeking to be asleep. They wish to be spoon fed rather than delving into the word and seeking to find the meat of the word for the time, this time in earth's history. So the recognition of scattered, disheartened, and unarmed condition of the Hebrews and the strength and the skill of their enemies, is this not giving us a, an example of us today against others that consider themselves great theologians? Mm -hmm. Now, is Barak a symbol of the call of this portion of the movement. Well, it definitely has to be. It, it, and it's, it's the message of July 18th in its initial presentation. I mean, it, it all just fits so nicely. I, I don't know how else we could take this. You know, if we're making an application to this movement, it, it definitely describes this fourth, you know, that I had written out. So we had Shamgar, and now we have this fourth, which is going to be uh, Deborah and Barak. Um, so Barak is, 
is a message that is given to the movement, but it's not presented um, even to the whole movement. Um, it takes this other message that that's then going to allow it to to do its work, which is the message of Deborah. Okay. Now I'm I'm going to drop down for just a moment. And it's also meant to to challenge Sisera. So we're we're saying that this Jabin and Sisera are tied to Parminder's message. No disagreement. Now, when I was looking at this, going to Patriarchs and Prophets. So Patriarchs and Prophets 545. So 545 reads as this. They forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, Judges 2.12, and guided them in the wilderness like a flock, Psalms 78.52. They provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images, Psalms 78.58.60. So, sorry, 78.58. Therefore, the Lord forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent where he placed, which he placed among them, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hands. Psalm 78, 60 and 61. Yet he, Lord God, did not utterly forsake his people. There was ever a remnant who were true to Jehovah. And from time to time, the Lord raised up faithful and valiant men to put down idolatry and to deliver the Israelites from their enemies. But when the deliverer was dead the, and the people were released from his authority, they would gradually return to their idols. And thus the story of backsliding and chastisement of confession and deliverance was repeated again and again. In this next paragraph, the king of Mesopotamia, the king of Moab, and after them the Philistines and the Canaanites of Hazor, led by Sisera, in turn became the oppressors of Israel. The way she's presenting it there is these four were successive in their oppression of Israel. Mm -hmm. I found this portion interesting. Othniel, Shamgar, and Ahud, Deborah and Barak were raised up as deliverers of their people. Rather than Othniel, Ahud and Shamgar, she places Shamgar second. But again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian. Here, the hand of the oppressor was fallen but lightly on the tribes dwelling east of the Jordan. But in the present calamities, they were the first sufferers. So, Othniel, Shamgar, Ahud, Deborah, and Barak were raised up to give defense from these enemies that attacked the children of Israel on their easternmost flank. That's the way I'm reading that paragraph. Does anyone else have a different way of looking at this? Um, well, Othniel, Ehud, Deborah, and Barak, that's on the eastern. Shamgar's on the west because of the Philistines. So here we have King of Mesopotamia, 
king of Moab. After that, after them, the Philistines. Right. And then the Canaanites of Hazor, led by Sisera. Right. So the Philistines here, she's going to mention set second, which, of course, is going to be Shamgar. So she lists him as second because she's mentioning the Philistines. So you have the king of Moab, the Philistines. And then you have the Canaanites of Hazor led by, by Sisera. So no. King of Mesopotamia. No, I've got this backwards. So the king of Mesopotamia is the first one. That's Othniel. Then right. The king of Moab is Ehud. But she right. puts Shamgar, she switches them. So right. she puts the, the nations in order, but she, she doesn't put Shamgar and Ehud in order. Right. Okay. And, and we said that Shamgar is existing in the time of Ehud, just on a different part. Right. Israel. Okay. And, and which makes sense, because if we're going to deal with Shamgar as being uh, this message regarding um, the chronology, the line upon line, the chiasms, this sort of does happen um, at the same time that you have Ehud happening. But, I mean, we're putting them success successively on the line as their starting point. Um, but we can see that uh, uh, Ehud, which is dealing with the chiasms of the 2520, Shamgar is addressing the same thing, but on a different part of Israel. Right? So they're both really addressing, but well, one's east and one's west. So why she put Shamgar and then Ehud rather than Ehud and Shamgar? If somebody was just reading this, they might think that Shamgar was Moab, dealing with Moab and Ehud with the Philistines. But she switches the two. The two names so there must be a reason why okay right just just right. as we're making an application to this movement that 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 puts that they're both sort of at the same time even though she talks about them in turn became oppressors of israel which is true they didn't happen at the same time but they are two different two different parts of israel So we have this situation of the king of Mesopotamia. We were making application that he was also representative of the king of the north, possibly that of the papacy. Or would we look at this more as Babylon? Well, I think it's more Babylon, and but it's in the church, not that the church is Babylon, but because uh, this is 9-11, right? So that's right. where we're going to have Othniel at 9-11, which is the spirit of repentance. And and this would just would re represent uh, the need of repentance from the false teachings okay. of Babylon. But it's not just about the false teachings. In, in the intellectual sense, but in the spiritual sense. These things that have basically infected Adventism. Um, so in a sense, and don't misunderstand me, but 9-11 is a call out of Babylon because it is the second angel's message. Right. And so it's not saying that the church is Babylon and that we're calling people out of the church. But spiritual Babylon has definitely conquered the church. The church is in captivity in Babylon, not that the church is Babylon. Right, because a call out of Babylon is not a call up to Babylonians. It's a call right. to God's people. And this has always been misunderstood in Adventism that, you know, well, the church is not Babylon. Well, that's true. But it doesn't mean that the church isn't in captivity to Babylon. Okay. So as we're looking at this, we have a message that is in a, that is attacking the movement, and this is a message 
of Babylon, the Moabites are those that had an interrelationship with the movement, but have gone off on their own. Right. So path of the just and et cetera. Right. Yeah. And now the Philistines. Well, and this is sort of, see, I look at these as kind of happening at the same time, even though we put them in order. Um, so if we look at what happened in the movement, so we're understanding this as in the movement. So, uh, you know, we had Othniel, which rep represented the Holy Spirit, and these two eight evils, Baal and Ashtoreth, the two extremes, the, um, you know, Fox and CNN I put there. But this is the message that Jeff was addressing prior to 9-11. And, and these are just different errors, the, the extremes of errors of belief. And then you're going to have the message come in, which is the 2520 comes in, well, in 2005. And then you're going to have, um, an, and that's 2005 to th 2012. Now, we have the, the message then from Shamgar, which is the ox goat. And what comes in in 2005 is the 2520. But this, this is now going to be attached to uh, a more specific chronology. And in that chronology that comes in in 2014 in Arkansas, when I, when I present uh, these structures, it, it's, it's just lightly regarded. The only people who seemed really interested in it was Jeff, because he invited me to speak, and also uh, some of the people from Brazil, because it was answering objections that they were having to deal with in Brazil. But we still don't see, um, you know, we still are going to be oppressed. Right. Even though we, we get this deliverance from oppression in a, in a certain sense, that is from these teachings that we had inherited from Adventism, we now have uh, a method in which to fight that. We have a message to counter what's, what's been presented. Now, you're always going to have people leave at that time. There's always going to be casualties when new light comes. But now we, we go from 2014 and we're going to deal with this history of, of um, Deborah and Barack. And that definitely brings us to 2017. You know, when we draw it on the line that I have behind me, which nobody can see. Well, I guess if you look at my screen, you could kind of see it. But, but do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so let's, let's look at your screen. Okay, well, Right here. And here we go. So you can see there we got, um, we can't see the whole thing, but we can't see the bottom. Does that make sense? Okay. So, as we look at this in, in this line, we're seeing this consecutive enemies coming before the children of Israel. The majority of these are attacking on the eastern side. We have the Philistines, however, that are defeated by Shamgar that are to the west. <laughs> Yeah. Now, as we as we come back before this, yeah, go ahead. this starts in 2017. Right. So, the, so the fourth here, this is going to be um, Barack and Deborah. 
Okay. So that's how you spell it. So, um, so this is going to be addressing first starting with Samuel Snow's letters and this whole, and, and you could even put 2016 there, I guess, but this is going to be the message of um, July 18th that's going to begin. So it's September 2017. I present July 18th as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. But again, you know, this is all lightly regarded. It's, it's sort of rejected by the movement for the most part. So this is going to, but the oppression that's here is this organization that starts. So you have two different things. Um, you have the organization. Um, so Barack and Deborah. So I should put here, if you're going to put it, I'll put it up here. So number four is the oppression of uh, Jabin and Sisera. Right? And this is a basically papal oppression, which has to do with organization. Right? Does that make sense? Logical. So if we go up here. Right, because that's what happens in 2017. We have the organizational meeting. You have the secrecy that's going on with what happened at that meeting and all these warning signs. But at the same time, we have a message regarding um, – did people see that backwards? I don't know. Whether that – would work but anyway looks okay okay just on my screen it looks backwards I don't know if that records it backwards or not anyway go back here so so the idea then it I mean this fits so well if we look at these different oppressions uh, I mean there's nothing else that could be described there's no other better way to describe it than what we see here in the story of Deborah and Barak as a message to counteract what happened in 2017 going up to 2019. Okay. I don't know if so now have comments on that or questions. Right. So when Deborah makes this call to Barak, she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So was she outside of Jericho or is this palm tree noted just so that we'll, we will pay attention to where she's where she's living well well i think it becomes a symbol of the message of jericho okay um so so we would understand you know once ffa supports uh they're supporting the july 18th prediction right which which is going to be related to the message of Revelation 9. Okay. Yeah. Right. Now, Rama itself is, um, it's a city, as we looked at, it's it's between um, Bethel, well, uh, between Bethel and Rama is Mitzpah, which is the watchtower. And Rama itself is about eight, um, eight miles north of Jerusalem. So this is all north of Jerusalem. So how many mitzvahs were there in Israel? I don't know. So I found a, I found a map that was identifying mitzvah as being in the north near Lake Merom. Okay. Well, there's probably more than one watchtower, but 
But this one here between Rama and Bethel would be Mitzpah. That's not obviously by Lake Moron. Okay. I mean, I'm asking, I'm asking this because as we see in this following verse, and she sent and called Barak, the son of, of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali. So here we have Kadesh being part of Naphtali, and I believe there's other areas that are also identified with Kadesh. Well, this is the Kadesh in Naphtali, right? So there's different places called Kadesh. Right. Kadesh Barnea. Um, but we have Kadesh Naphtali here. So if Barak is being called out of Kadesh Naphtali, what does Kadesh mean? Well, it means holy. It's the, it's, it's the word that's translated as, as the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Kadesh. Kodesh. Okay. Yeah. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? Yeah. So in Mount Tabor, of course, that's up by Lake Moron. Or it's actually uh, basically you have uh, Nazareth, uh, Mount Tabor is between Nazareth and the Sea of Galilee. Okay. But, but Marom's just up above that. So that's that area. Um, now, you also have Rama is, the one thing I always think when I think of Rama is a voice was heard in Rama, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. She wouldn't be comforted because they are no more. And so I always think about that when, when I see Rama. But you got Rama, so this weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, and then you have Bethel in Mount Ephraim. So that's where Deborah is between this, this weeping and the house of God. So this would bring us back to the mourners again. Uh, John <laughs> verse 1. Yeah, it, it brings us back to those that are sighing and crying before the altar, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. And I will draw unto thee the river Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's armies, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. So what's being said here, I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon. I'm going to bring Sisera, Sisera to this river Kishon. Why is that important for us to know? What symbol is Kishon? Do we have a name meaning for Kishon? Yeah, I'm trying to find it here. You're just going way too fast for me because. <laughs> I'm going fast for you? Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm still looking at other things that we already talked about. I know. <laughs> um, so Kishon means winding. It's a river in central Palestine. Um, and, and just to get a more picturesque kind of way of looking at it, it means to bend, uh, used only as a denom denominative, uh, it means to set a trap or lay a snare. That's kind of a, uh, the idea of the winding there. Okay. The Hebrew word kosher. A place of ensnarement, would that be a, a way of looking at this? 
Yeah. So it's kind of a trap. Yeah. So what's being said is we are going to entrap Sisera. Right. Using the river Kishon. Mm -hmm. And his chariots and his multitude, I will deliver him into thine hand. Mm -hmm. And then the reference is given back in the chat. Thank you, Aran. First Kings 1840. And Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook, Kishon, and slew them there. Yeah, so we're going to have them slain at Kishon. Isn't it interesting that this verse, 1 Kings 1840, that we could look at this as having an interrelationship to August 11th, 1840. Which is tied to July 18th. Exactly. Yeah. Now. And Barak said unto her, if thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou will not go with me, then I will not go. That's a bold statement. Here is a man that has been chosen by God to bring a signal victory for the children of Israel. But he is saying to Deborah, I'm only going to do this if you go. But this is exactly what I said. Right. So when it came to July 18th, I had made the decision that I was not going to promote the message unless FFA did. And at that time, there was no indication that that was going to happen until September 7th happened. Okay. So, you know, I mean, and it was very, very specific for me um, when Parminder uh, was in, uh, in Germany there, they're having these meetings and, you know, I knew what was going on. I made the decision that I was going to, I was not going to press July 18th. Um, that, that that was something that was in God's hands. And so for me, I mean, I, I see this quite clearly in my own actions. Um, so unless Jeff had picked it up, this message would not have gone forward. So are you, is the, the application being made that FFA is representative of Deborah? Well, the message that FFA gave in regard to July 18th, I don't think so much the organization, but that they took up that message. So you need Deborah, you need the movement, the woman, in this case, the church, to, to go with the message. Interesting. That's, that's what happened historically, as far as uh, as my experience was. Okay. Now, as we return here, Barack now. Okay. FFA is on Bumblebee Road. That is the School of the Prophets is. Right. 
North North Bumblebee Road to be exact. And that's because one of the name meanings is B, right? Deborah means a B. Okay. So Barack now marshaled an army of 10,000 men and marched to Mount Tabor as the Lord had directed. Sisera immediately assembled an immense and well-equipped force expecting to surround the Hebrews and make them an easy prey. The Israelites were but poorly prepared for an encounter and looked with terror upon the vast armies spread out in the plain beneath them, equipped with all the implements of warfare and provided with the dreaded chariots of iron. These were so constructed as to be terribly destructive. Large scythe-like knives were fastened to the axles so that the chariots being driven through the ranks of the enemy would cut them down like wheat before the sickle. Our application being that this message that was to be given was one that could be destroyed quickly because of what's happened before. What, what do you mean? Well, okay, how, how many times have there been others after William Miller that have made a prediction of something and the prediction fell apart? Well, I don't know, I can't keep track. Well, with, within Protestantism, have there not been different pastors that have made predictions? Well, I mean, you got, of course, the early Miller, the, the, the Millerites, the Adventists, or the first day Adventists. You have even the ones who were connected with Ellen White making time predictions. You have the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, which are a branch of that. I mean, all through history, we have people making predictions, which is why us making a prediction looked rather foolish. Right. Yeah. So the enemies, those that are being commanded by Sisera, are equipped where they would be able to cut down those that they came against with these knives that are attached to the axles of their chariots. I mean, as a harvest tool, that would have been interesting for that time, but we're talking about something here that is meant strictly for destruction. Yeah. Now, and she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman, and Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went with him. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent under the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kadesh. We have now identified the message as being like this of Barak. We have identified Deborah as being equivalent with FFA. 
for our consideration until tomorrow's meeting, who and what can we identify Heber as being? Because now we have this, this player that's going to come into our view. What application can we make of Heber and of his wife in this situation? If we're applying all of these other individuals as being messages, yeah. What message do we see from Heber? What message do we see from his wife, JL? Well, I mean, I have ideas already, but. Okay. So as we're coming to the close of today's meeting, we have a couple of minutes remaining. From that which we have already addressed, does anyone have any comments or thoughts? And we're going to take this up with Heber the Kenite tomorrow. But do we have any other thoughts or comments regarding what we've, we've just gone over? Does anyone have any concerns of these items? Well, I don't, I don't have any concerns. Yeah, I need to go go and review this again when there's less things on my mind, and uh, yeah, and ponder it. Okay. Anyone else? Um, well, just one thing. So we we have Jaden and we have Sisera. So why do we have the two? Why do we just have Sisera being the general? Because Jabin represents the papacy. Um, so this is a message that's associated with papal teaching or doctrine. Okay. It's not well, uh, I know that, sorry, says Ra means servant of the sun. So it could be to do with sun worship and the Sunday law. Okay, you, you had the name Sisra, meaning servant of the sun? That yeah, what that's what I read online. That's one, one of the meetings, and also uh, swift and keen as a horse. Okay, I had battle array. Uh, I know. I was looking at the, uh, the, the uh, Bible study tools. I think that's where I got it. <clears throat> Okay, let's pick back up then with Sisera and then go into Heber for first thing tomorrow. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because we have to address that a little bit. Uh, I guess in Egyptian, Sisera means servant of Ra. Sisera. So he wouldn't be Egyptian, so... That could be a false etymology. But anyway, yeah, so we're going to have to address that, why there is this general Sisera, and then okay. also what, who, who Heber is, and, um, and all that. that. That message represents specifically. Okay. All right. So shall we, if there's no other comment, shall we close with prayer? Yeah. Gracious Father in heaven, as we have looked upon these lessons and these examples that you have left for us today, we are amazed, we are humbled, we see our great need of your direction. Be with us now, Father. Help us so that your word 
may become our guide in all things that we do and in the directions that we accept and that we take. Please bless us today. Bring us again together tomorrow and help us to understand these lessons and apply them correctly for our time and for our edification so that our characters may become more like yours. For this, we thank you. And for this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Recording.